Let me ask you this. Is it morally okay to kick a robotic dog? It doesn't have feelings, it can't feel pain, it's got no emotion. But there's a far more interesting question, in my opinion, whether or not it's morally okay for a human to have sex with it. If you want to see the future, just look at the sex industry today. Oftentimes it's about human contact. They want to have a fun evening. They want to have a conversation, a laugh, and then yes, sex. It might be that gradually people get over this idea that sex must be between two people. Many of us might form relationships to somebody who's not a real person. In 2007, I predicted that by the year 2050, people would be not only falling in love and having sex with them, but would also be marrying them. And I believe that time frame is still very valid. Sexual desire is always about fetishization. When you look at pornography, you're looking at a pair of tits, or you're looking about a bum. This is not to humanize something, this is to have an object that you want to chase to give yourself some satisfaction. I'm Sylvia. What turns you on? I think the more we start exploring with this new concept of seeing yourself as something else, then you can choose what you want to be. Maybe I want to be a cube and have a sex in Lego world. I mean, who's gonna stop me? We opened Naughty Harbor two years ago. The first idea was open fully robotic world hall, offering robotic sex dolls. And virtual reality with sex dolls was the first step. I want to be the first to be prepared for age of sex robots. What is really interesting that our customer are really normal people where, uh, who, who you can meet on streets, handsome guy. We have many regular customers. For example, last month we have 60% of regular customers. And I believe that many lonely people will have this opportunity. There are loads of people in the world who, for one reason or another, can't make successful human relationships. They have no human partner, they have no one to love, they have no one who loves them. I think that when robots are sufficiently sophisticated to satisfy all of those needs, the world will be a much happier place. All of these lonely people will cease to be lonely. I think a lot of people in an ideal world, they would like to see a world without sex work, without sex dolls. I don't think that's realistic. Being an anthropologist of the future and being interested in this theme of the future of love, I think for over a decade now, I hear people say that they're working on productions on super realistic sex dolls, like sex robots. In my experience, in my research, I've seen a couple of them and I found them very disappointingly not realistic. So when I got to Naughty Harbor, I was excited. I was like, yay, I can now finally not just read about it, but actually experience how it is. I got there, I think in the morning, found the brothel in a lovely neighborhood, which for some reason I hadn't really expected. I was welcomed in by somebody who looked a bit surprised. I don't think they had expected a relatively young woman. I think the majority of their customers is male. They let me in, guided me around a bit, and opened the door where Nick was lying ready for me. I think this was it, friend. I think I'm done. It has been a wonderful experiment. It was, it was a bit more sad than I even imagined. I just kind of sat there on the bed and looked at the doll and tried to imagine what shall we do now? There's really nothing that kind of works for me in this setting. It feels like a dead person, but then within a huge boner, I guess. A sex doll is really just a completely inanimate object. It's like a masturbation tool, really. A sex robot has animation, it has intelligence, it can converse. An interesting parallel with what's happening now in the world of artificial intelligence first occurred in the late 60s. In the world of computer chess, which is a field I've been deeply involved in all my life, chess masters would look at games played by computer programs and laugh because the moves were so bad. And that's a very good example 
how quickly things can change. That was truly astonishing what we've just seen, and it just shows. Because <laughs> Barov cannot believe it, he's in shock. From that point onwards, Grandmasters have genuinely been learning from chess programs because the programs could beat every human player in the world. The same thing is happening with artificial intelligence. I think the first products that we can call sex robots will actually be appearing on the market probably within the next year or so. We recognize that virtual reality is first step to make fully robotic brothels. But this is so easy that many people want to try it and it's much easier than go to bar and ask some girl and I think it will be much bigger in the future than now. These dolls, to me, they look like they're trying to like, replace a human and in the end of the day, it's a doll. We are a collective of artists and engineers drawn together to create multi-sensory solutions for cybersex. We started as a research project, and um, our question was whether shared multi-sensory arousal is possible in a virtual reality environment in the presence of another uh, human being. So now we are going to put all of that inside. You're ready for your cyber adventures. <laughs> These environments, they have to be shared. They, they, there has to be some social elements to that. Because even in our research that we conducted last year, what we discovered is that the data that we got from people experiencing it together, it was arousing. You can experience some nipple stimulation. <laughs> we, as a humans, it's our mission to maintain connection together, despite how much we're going to evolve in the future and how much we're going to change. The connectivity that we have, we need to maintain. So right now they are seeing themselves as the wire mesh. And every interaction they are having right now in a virtual space has a vibrating effect on Steph. She's feeling that touch. Go, touch her tits. <laughs> For me, personally, none of this technology that we're working with is designed to replace humans. I want to make it very clear, and even robotics that we will be developing, and we already started developing, they are not to replace, they are there to extend. They are for us to start experiencing new ways of sexuality and sensuality. It also has a lot of pressure on humans to just not lose connection between themselves. Unfortunately, sex dolls or sex robots, how are they being called these days, they all look like a imaginary porn stars because they are being created by men uh, who are just creating what they want to see without really asking for other people's opinions. I would, of course, um, have deep reservations about the inherent misogyny bound up in these industries, without a doubt. Whether or not one wants to condemn them morally for it is a different question. I mean, the idea that one can simply say, well, we're, we're providing a public service to people who want to be able to indulge in their sexual fantasies. Well, porn does that already. It's merely a male projection on what sexuality means. So you have these hyper big breasts, these very skinny middles. You see an avatar. You have to consider in what image is the person creating these robots, these AI systems, whatever. Is this person, you know, a Western white man who wants to replicate or create the ideal vision of beauty of a woman in Western culture? When it comes to sex robots, there are some people who strongly oppose it. I think they're taking a too narrow perspective on it because the sex object in this case is quite literal. Quite often, uh, the titillation and moral outrage make people overlook the really tough engineering challenges. You're essentially having several tens of kilograms of body that needs to move several meters per second in close proximity to an unprotected human without doing any damage. This is an engineering challenge that I wouldn't want to take on myself, but I assume there are going to be some people who are very motivated to figure it out. Until people can have meaningful, entertaining, loving, sensitive conversations with software, we will not be at the stage for deep, intimate relationships and marriage. Wow.
I'm not an anthropologist, I'm a robotic scientist, so what I'm giving you is only my opinion. I think uh, social interaction is very important and it can play a very important role for reducing loneliness, for instance. Professional nurses told us that in many cases when they interact with people, it is important just to show that they are paying attention to them. So asking questions, showing interest, we used to call this kind of a conversation a chit-chatting. So we like to say that the robot chit-chats with people. What I've done in the last year is to coordinate a big European project in which we try to develop robots for health care, in particular for elderly care. Do you ever watch football on TV? Yes. Tell me what you like the most about football. Having an artificial AI that is able to understand when it is time to listen to the person and maybe ask the right question and then again listen and letting the person talk is a very important thing. I, I would like to talk about my family. It happened that uh, a man asked to talk about his wife. Just to confirm, can we talk about your wife? Yes. You, can, you could see from his eyes that he was really happy to be given the chance to talk about his wife and his family. And he wanted to have something, somebody maybe, but also something was sufficient to listen to him. My wife was born in 1943 and we were married in 1965. What is important to say is that we don't build robots, we build AI for robots, so anything could connect through the network to the cloud and then become capable of competent conversation. It's very nice to be here with you. Please tell me if there is anything I can do for you. Some people really establish a close relationship with the robot. They are interacting with something which is not a, a living being, it has a program, and the program is just making computation. If you are talking about artificial intelligence whose task is to interact with people, then maybe we need less than we may think. Could we have a true friendship with a robot? Well, I can certainly imagine having a robot that is trying to optimize my happiness. It might very well be that you don't need consciousness to have true friendship. You now see more and more robots. Like if you, I recently walked into a bank office, for example, and there was a robot welcoming me in. It makes it very easy to be impolite to the robot, right? It makes it very easy to be unkind. I've noticed myself being very unkind to the algorithm Siri app in my phone when it was giving me a stupid answer. You know, if you really create sex robots or sex dolls, then perhaps young males will start to abuse them or be much more aggressive in their sexual behavior than they would have dared towards a human being. Of course, um, there is a certain, uh, well, certain, a major element of violence and a major element of um, suffering that is going to be um, sewn into these fantasy worlds. One could argue, well, at least it's not on real humans, which is really not much of an argument. We've already seen that various sorts of disaster can happen when malicious people hack into computer systems. A robot that has access to, to one's genitalia could do all sorts of damage. My life as an investor is a little bit easier. Obviously there is huge ethical side of it that we need to solve. This is actually much more complicated and longer process rather than our scientific and technical readiness. With current pace of advancements in technology, AI going to be far more superior than us. And we humans, we are so simple in computer terms. I'm pretty sure the next version of AI can reproduce 99.9% of human feelings, reactions, and therefore ability to love. You know, I think a lot of the anxiety around AI is, is what's behind them? Are they really there? Is there somebody in there? 
And this is the, the condition of human beings anyway, because all human interaction involves this sort of abyssal character of assuming, is there somebody really in there? I don't know. But I have to assume, if I'm an ethical being, that underneath there, there is an ethical suffering person, and I don't want to hurt them. So when we're talking about the AI, we're really just talking about the same question. If we're thinking about cutting-edge current AI systems, the most advanced look like they have roughly similar capabilities as a small animal, I mean, maybe a mouse or something like that. Certainly a real mouse we think is capable of at least a minimal degree of sentience. It can feel pleasure and pain. It might be that the time is soon close where we need to begin to think in similar moral terms about these digital minds that we are creating. If we would consider the idea that in 50 or 100 or 300 years from now, we would have sex dolls or algorithms that have sentience, then I think we're creating something really dangerous. If I would be such a sex doll, for example, the first thing that I would do is turn my back against my designers and create a nice life for myself. So if I would be the designer then, I'm not so sure if I would invest all my time and energy in that path. So there is a very important question here. What do we really need from artificial intelligence? For me, the unfortunate answer is, uh, I think we're just a few years away from a you know, singularity point. We are already having intimate relationships with AI. It's just the scale of it is very different. Some people care about their phone much more than they would care about their family members. <laughs> this, this is a really harsh reality, but this is true. I think society, we have this idea that any and all tech that gets mentioned in any piece of media is definitely coming at some point, the question is when. But realistically, if we think about it differently and go, well, actually, do we want this? Do we need this? Think about our last five years on Earth. When we are the most fragile, there's going to be a lot of AI-enabled help. Our parents and our grandparents living in peace, supported by a lot of helpers. The more we know about a science and about a technology, the quicker it is to advance to the next step. I'm married to a male. Uh, I'm very happy to say that, yeah, yeah, marriage is about love between two people. Uh, it doesn't have anything to do with the genders. And I'm totally willing to say, yeah, marriage between two intelligent beings. Why should we keep it within one species? The question is, of course, could there be a meeting of minds, a bearing of souls? This is a very dangerous path. I just want to make sure that in the future we're not using the AI-generated experiences as a replacement. It's so easy just to kind of put on the headset and forget about the rest of the world, but the connectivity that we have, we need to maintain. I guess, I guess that's it, right? Like, yeah, if you would only have sex with a sex doll, then, you know, it's just, it's just not exciting. Somebody who's always ready, somebody who says yes, is always interested. I think we'd, we'd probably be done after a week or so.